your invitation to get early access to Apple Card. You wanted to be one of the first to get Apple Card, a new kind of credit card created by Apple, not a bank. Actually, shouldn't that be created by Apple and a bank? But we're not gonna do that. I think that we can do better by maximizing our earn via the Sapphire Freedom Duo. For the sake of this video, I'm not even going to use my personal valuation of Ultimate Rewards, which currently stands at 2.19 cents per point. Instead, I'll undervalue and claim they're only worth one cent each. This is the rate one receives if one elects to convert points to cash or statement credits. Before talking Chase, let's run over the Apple Card basics. We've got a current sign-up bonus of zero dollars, which is pretty lame. One will further earn 3% cash back on Apple purchases, a just announced 3% on Uber, two on all transactions made via Apple Pay, and one on everything else. These earn categories lead us to a question that friends and family members always ask when they hear I play the points and miles game. So, what kind of credit card should I get? My answer to this is always the same. Good question. Give me a percentage breakdown of your previous full year's spend by category and whether or not you anticipate any spending pattern changes. They usually look confused. I look smug. It's a bad time all around. The point being, there is no universal answer. It's kind of like asking what kind of vehicle to get with no other information. Do you have a family to haul? Do you need to haul things? Do you want to wear a bag over your head for fear of being seen in your truck? The point being is that our personal requirements drive the decision. As it pertains to the Apple Card, one person could claim the earn rate is great, while another could claim it's terrible, and they'd both be correct. It just depends on your spend. Do you spend $20,000 per year on Apple products? If yes, then this card makes sense. Do you spend $20,000 a year on overseas travel? If yes, then the Sapphire Preferred is the better option. Taking a look at the Apple Card's terms and conditions, and we see some pretty standard stuff. An APR of 12.99 to 23.99%, a 28-day grace period, and most excellently, no fees. I'm assuming this includes foreign transaction ones, but would like to see that explicitly stated somewhere. Like everything Apple, they're going for simplicity here. It appears to be an Apple wallet-based virtual card first and a titanium physical one second. So it looks nice, appears simple to use, and has a totally respectable earn rate. Not too bad. Representing Chase, we've got the Sapphire Preferred, and we'll be matching it to the Freedom Unlimited. Before getting into the raw numbers, let's talk about why we picked these two cards. The Chase Sapphire Preferred. Many players have lost their points and miles of virginity to this piece of plastic. This card is included because it provides one access to Chase's outstanding Ultimate Rewards program and provides a nice everyday bonus on travel and dining. What's more, Chase's definition of travel is broad. Everything from Ubers, trains, airfare, hotels, it's all included. And it's a worldwide bonus category. Finally, use of this card overseas won't trigger any obnoxious foreign transaction fees. I chose the $95 Sapphire Preferred over the $450 Sapphire Reserve because I'm assuming those looking at the fee-free Apple Card have no interest in the premium credit card market, even though I could make a value case for the more expensive option. The Chase Freedom Unlimited is used for everything else, it earns a flat 1.5% on all purchases. Now, I get it. Managing even two cards might come across as cumbersome, especially for those who value the Apple card for its simplicity. But it's really not that hard. And once you learn the basics, it becomes second nature. The basic rules are, 
If we're outside of the country or paying for travel or dining, we're using our Sapphire Preferred. For everything else, we use our Freedom Unlimited. Learning the points and miles game is a bit like when you're first learning to drive a car. As someone who's presumably been doing it for some time, it's probably all muscle memory by now. But when you were 15 or 16, there were a ton of things to learn. How to manipulate the clutch, who has the right of way, what do all the signs mean, what's the proper signal distance. But once it becomes part of your daily routine, you don't think about it any longer. And that's really how the points and miles game is played. Easy, right? So, like I've done before, I want to show you guys some real world numbers and what kind of earning we can expect when using either option. I'm going to use my personal 2018 full year spending patterns and apply those percentages to a hypothetical $20,000 annually. This time around, it gets a little tricky because I don't have good data surrounding Apple Pay usage rates. To fill in for this gap, the number 65 comes into play. This is the percentage of US retailers which currently accept phone-based payments, at least according to a January 2019 Apple press release. Accordingly, I'll use that as the number of merchants who would have earned Apple cards two points per dollar had I really been trying. To put this another way, we're going to say that the Apple card earns 1.65 cents per dollar on everyday purchases. With these assumptions in mind, let's look at the results. We have a gross earn of $332.26 on the Apple Card and $314.02 for the Chase Sapphire Freedom Duo. So for some people, this may be enough to call it. The new card from Apple beats the Duo from Chase when just looking at earn from everyday spend. However, I think it's a bit more complicated. I know I said earlier that I'd limit the value of an ultimate reward to its cash back value, just one cent. But what? What if we were to get a little crazy and acknowledge the fact that Chase allows Sapphire preferred cardholders to redeem for 1.25 cents per point via the Expedia powered ultimate rewards travel portal? Our new earnings look something like this. We're still looking at $332 in value from the Apple Card and $392 from the Chase Duo. Because there are so many valuables, I created a little calculator which does a bit of the work for you. It's available on my website. It's still a beta test, so I would appreciate any feedback. Link is below. Uh, I plan on rolling them out for future comparisons as well. Anywho, uh, you'll be able to input annual spend and adjust for any potential bonus purchasing. You'll also be able to vary the value of an ultimate reward to whatever you think is appropriate. So yeah, let me know what you think. Moving on from return on spend, let's talk purchase protection. The Apple card is lacking in both execution and information here. Apple's website doesn't mention the topic, neither does the terms of service. The only data I could find comes from the card's payment processor, MasterCard. It looks about as bare bones as one could imagine. We've got some basic liability protection, some ID theft coverage, a shop runner membership, and some other dumb things like priceless cities and golf that will most likely go unused. Overall, a big disappointment. Quite oppositely, the Chase Sapphire Freedom Duo has some of the best card benefits available. $10,000 per person trip interruption coverage, a primary rental car collision damage waiver, baggage delay insurance, $500 per trip delay coverage, $500 per claim purchase protection and warranty extensions of one year. In other words, when it comes to card provided peace of mind, the Apple card doesn't even feel like it's playing in the same league as the Chase Sapphire Freedom Duo. Now, before we start wrapping things up, let's look at net year one value. The Chase setup is going to come with some annual fees, but we'll make up for that with sign up bonuses. The Apple card has neither, which I suppose is both good and bad. The Sapphire Preferred is currently offering 60,000 ultimate rewards for a kind of high $4,000 minimum spend. The Chase Freedom Unlimited is offering 3 points per dollar on the first 
$20,000. And here we go. We've got an intro bonus of $0 on the Apple card and $600 from the Sapphire Preferred. Year 1 return on spend is the previously mentioned $332 on the Apple card and $560 on the Duo. The latter's increase is due to the Freedom Unlimited's year 1 3 point per dollar sign up bonus. I'm assigning a value of $0 to the Apple Card's purchase protection, or lack thereof, and $50 to the Sapphire Duo. It's a bit arbitrary, but more than anything, I wanted to just acknowledge how much better it is. The cost of the cards is next. $0 for the Apple Card, and $95 for the Sapphire Preferred. Okay, Gear 1 is a blowout. The Chase Sapphire Freedom Duo beats the Apple Card by $782. To be honest, this isn't all unexpected. That's what sign-up bonuses will do. They massively skew Year 1 net valuations. Also, keep in mind, this is with an undervalue of ultimate rewards. I personally peg them at 2.19 cents per point. At that valuation level, instead of beating the Apple card by $782, Chase wins by 2,163. This is like the Major Leagues versus Little League. It's not even close. Moving on to year two and things even out. With intro bonuses gone and ultimate rewards valued at one cent each, the Apple Card wins by $63. So, final thoughts. I like the Apple Card, but it's not for me. It's got some great features. From everything I read, Apple is trying to make keeping track of spending as easy as looking through some iMessages. For some, there might be a lot of value in this. Apple also makes earnings available immediately via daily cash. I like that, but feel it's more of a novelty than a decision-altering feature. Furthermore, I really like the fact that help is just an SMS away. I really wish Chase would do that. When it comes to second year earnings and cash out valuations of ultimate rewards, the Apple card does very well, beating the Chase duo. But to get to that point, we had to drop the value of Chase points below what I believe they're worth. In the end, the Apple Card versus the Chase Sapphire Freedom Duo is a bit like the old Mac versus Windows debate. You might get more for your money with the Microsoft-based platform, but the Mac and its iOS integration sure makes life easy. And that's exactly who I think the Apple Card is great for. People who just say, look, I want a card that doesn't screw me over earnings wise and that I don't even have to think about. The points game does take some work and for people like me who play, it can be kind of fun. But others might have different priorities. For me, I'm sticking with Chase, but I definitely won't be rolling my eyes at anyone breaking out their Apple card.